I, for a long time, I was a scientist guy that saw the data, analyzed it, and you figure it out, you know. Uh, but I've changed, and here's how I've changed. Renewables as a base load are a gigantic waste of valuable time and money. Base loads and renewables in this two column list. We've got the four common base loads over there. They, their property is that they um, can supply power 24 hours a day pretty dependably. And over on the right side of the renewables, uh, the ones I've done, I've done in yellow are ones that I'm going to spend a short time with proof data saying they just can't cut it. They will not become dependable uh, replacing any of the base loads. And on the method for wind, solar, and hydro, what I do is take the transfer of energy that what they do it's in the, into their power curves and look at their curves and say these aren't going to cut it. All right, let's start out with wind generators, all 160 tons of them. And I'm going to look at the transfer curve for that generator and say there's something wrong with it. This is a commercial uh, piece here that came from the uh, Estes Corporation in Denmark. So we're looking at real data right here. This is as the wind speed increases, the power increases, and it slopes and then it hits it up there. I'm going to pick out two points on there that say this is not very good. First one I'll pick out is up at the top where it levels off. And this is where you finally get the nameplate value of three megawatts. Uh, it's in meters per second down there. The translated number is 2.2, so that really is 33 mile per hour wind. And you get uh, gusting that moves it around a bit while it's on there. So you'd probably like to locate it out halfway out on it, where it says 20, which is 44. Um, now, what we're saying, if you want to get this thing to run like you paid for it, you've got to have a steady 44 mile an hour wind all year long, every hour, if you're going to compete with the big boys. It doesn't do that at all. And so that's one of the features I'm using their data to say you can't replace uh, the, the uh, ba base loads. All right, let's go down to the very bottom where it's just starting. You never thought of it. They have a cut-in speed. This cut-in speed is about <coughs> six or seven miles an hour. And uh, let's move up a point to where it says five, uh, and that is 11 miles per hour. You can get 11 mile an hour wind and nothing is really happening. And so let's look at data on the data. Here's a great website, weatherspark.com. You guys, if you're copying, copy that one down. You type in weatherspark.com, hit return. It'll give you a little block and say, where do you want to look for data? I put in Safety Harbor, which is where I live. And then you'll get a, a file there with about 8 to 10 his, history of, of weather in that area. And it, it uses 35 years of, of NOAA data to do this. Now, the, the black curve on there is the mean value in my little town. None of those values go above what we were looking back on the transfer curve of even turning it on. That is why you see none of these in the state of Florida. And that a wind generator is really by itself very quite inefficient. The farms for them typically have 150 or 200 uh, or more uh, be good to make up for that deficit. All right, let's go on to uh, um, solar here. The solar curve here in blue, that's the ideal. This was taken by Jerry Soden back in there. He presented this information. Uh, it's, this is just a wonderful place to do solar, 300 days of cloud-free days, uh, high altitude. And then three weeks later, he noticed it was an overcast and he redid that, and that's the yellow part down there. For an overcast sky, it just went to pieces. And the little spikes in there, I think, were uh, solar photons made their way through the overcast. <coughs> and uh, it, it, if you, first time I saw curves like this, I said, good God, I thought we we're getting power out of that. but. It's not, and I'll show you one more because we thought this was so good. This is one from Melbourne, Australia. It says, clear winter day, overcast winter day. Look how the plummet is. This burned into your brain uh, about when you see solar. Solar residential people are very happy with what they have. But when you try to talk about taking it up to replacing base loads, it just doesn't quite happen. Um, and I'll show the the weather spark here I typed in rain this is in my locale in Safety Harbor and uh, you see that the probability of rain in the middle of the summer is like 0.71 that's 
that's terrible because you go back and say, let me think of those two curves I just looked at. Uh, we're not going to get really good solar. Say Florida sunshine, uh, we get rain, we don't get snow, but we get days with the cumulus cloud cover up there, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the total. We get huge, and every one time one of those shadows from one of those goes over, you know what'll happen. All right, let's go to the third one, which is um, hydroelectric. This is a tragedy. But, <laughs> This is a tragedy. This is a Coley, Grand Coulee Dam uh, commissioned in 1942. It, uh, 80 years almost, it delivered just like a uh, total power that was strong. It has a nameplate of 7.1 gigawatts. That's huge. And right now it's kind of in trouble. And let me show you that power equation off on the right there. It's equal to two constants. The first one is the water density. The second one is the um, gravity acceleration factor, constants. And then you get to the third one, which is H sub W, which is really the height of the reservoir behind it. And so its power is linearly related to that. And the problem is right now is that the snowpack that forever would melt off this great volume of water has been going down for 20 years. And here's the result. This is getting a whole lot of press now, all national this is the Lake Mead Dam for, for the Hoover Dam, and there are other dams upstream from this like this. And the present, as of yesterday, when I looked it up, they said the, the water level in the reservoir is at 27% 20, of, of full. And you look at that if power equation to the right, and you say, we're in trouble, because that 22-year trend does not appear to be stopping. All right, here's the final on the the level that we're talking about. This German data in 217, this is for their whole, the whole country for the whole year. The, the energy sources on the left and how much percent uh, that they did. <coughs> Let's skip the, the base loads up there and go right to the renewables. They got wind, solar, they invested very heavily. This is not something they put together the night before. It's about 22 years ago they began. And so the sum total for that is down at the very bottom, 33.1 percent. When they threw everything at it, they could. This is what a curve, what a piece of data this is. You know, this is a whole German country throwing in. Who, if you're not a believer and you want to fight it, how can you fight these this types of data? So we're going to go on now and elevate just a little bit what we're looking at. This, so that you've been around, <coughs> probably recognizes. Those who know the most of nuclear reactors fear it the least. Those who know the least of nuclear fear it the most. I heard that woman's name from England mentioned yesterday, and I think of her when I see her. On, they know it, they fear it the most. And that's, it's, a, it's a PR problem. I'm going to go for one more on fear, which is uh, Jim Conk. Jim, are you in the room here? There you go. Okay. I, I put this in there before I, I didn't even know you existed. <laughs> And I, and when I, and I saw you on there, I had to better get down and get your name in the bottom here. This, this is uh, the death print that he put out there. And I put in yellow the ones that, that we can look at. Let's just compare coal with 10,000 and nuclear with 0.1. And um, I think I know where 0.1 humans come from. I, I'm aware that in 1989 there was one uranium miner death. That, that may be where that came from. Two things to look up. Uh, the, the nuclear global average 90, that's probably about 100 percent of the Chernobyl contribution to bad engineering. Uh, now look from hydro north, hydro, wind, solar, look at all those numbers there. All those energy sources have something in common that the nuclear does not have in common. What is that? They give fatality a, a pass, right? Which one other doesn't get a pass on fatality? Nuclear. And this is, this is, fear is just so real in us, but we've got to keep hammering. And uh, let me go on here. Uh, this is, I've said this before, but one major thing is solar, wind, hydro depend on the weather. You don't want to build a stable system that's depend on the weather. A friend in England, it, uh, they had two weeks of no wind. And so that's what you get when it's working, it's working. And all renewables need a specific location. Uh, that, let me just keep going on there. Uh, this is two more to go here. This is the what if. I think these are important, important things I must. What if the river 
Frisco Drive. There are 44 hydroelectric dams out there in Colorado, the St. Bernard and the uh, Colorado River. What if they're going down right now? They're, what if we lose all that power? How are we going to replace it? What if the fracking has a short life? It has uh, geologic data and financial analysis saying fracking is not 200 years, it may be 10 to 20 years. Extreme weather has occurred in California <coughs> around the San Francisco area. Temperatures for two or three days rose to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. That is just startling. And the power company made this comment that said uh, uh, to all their, their customers, they said, we know you're going to turn the air conditioner on all the time, but if you pretend everything is normal and you're going to watch TV and wash your clothes, we can't provide the power that you want and we'll have blackouts. What a startling statement in America. We cannot provide the power that you want. Uh, and then the uh, extreme, uh, that, let me skip. I was going to put a fifth one down there. I see it getting too noisy, but, but I would have put down, <coughs> excuse me, electric vehicles. That, that, these are all what I have in white here, <coughs> saying this is power we don't have at the moment, but it's going to hit us pretty fast. So then the power crisis, utilities must quickly increase base load production. Uh, man, if we had our thorium thing ready to go, it, it, it looks like, I don't want to say the sky is falling, but, <laughs> you know, and I looked at that and I said, but there's data behind those, those little things. Maybe, maybe it's not true. So um, here's my last thoughts, and they're, they're kind of wobbled around since. I, I noted that the national labs, when they were a team way back, they developed the atom bomb in two years and nine months. Incredible problems, but they had, you know what they had, it was just incredible. And, and then a few years later, they gave us the first commercial nuclear reactor in the United States. The Nautilus submarine in five years, and they say, what happened to Rickover? He was the engineer on the job. The, the, the whole basis of that came from the Oak Ridge National Lab, and he went there. <laughs> Hello? 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 <laughs> I thought he, I was singing or something. <laughs> uh, so uh, that um, I, the national labs have changed a great deal from them. Their culture is different now. Whether they're the right ones to do it, maybe as we we could have a, say a, a pop-up national lab to, to dedicate itself without some of the baggage that the, the, the national labs and their organization carry. Uh, that one I don't know, but we need things now. It's not like, well, we'll get it by 2030. I think we're heading that if statements, things that we're not preparing for, and even if we prepare, we're not, we don't have the goods to go. So it could be a crisis now. I think that gets me to the end. Uh, that's a delusion. I'll put uh, also my, I may regret putting my email down there, but uh, if, uh, we there? <laughs> okay. Thank you.